Hey, product launchers, Tom Hazard here on another great session of Product Launch Hazards. And today we've got one of our rather new experts on the platform, Apurva Batra from Flexible Pouches. And he's been on once before. Tracy uh, had him on and they had a, a, a good general session to get you acquainted um, with our new expert here. And today, uh, he's going to take us on uh, a little different journey, talking about a few things from his personal uh, business experience, not only about packaging, which is an area that a lot of you would be interested in, but also potentially some other general entrepreneurial and business related subjects. So thank you for joining us again today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Apurva Batra. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Flexible Pouches. Uh, we are a company that aims to sort of level the playing field for uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses, uh, you know, level the playing field with the big boys, really, um, because uh, product packaging is one of those things that, um, you know, really makes or breaks your product here. And so, um, you know, historically, custom branded packaging, you know, fully printed, custom branded, customized packaging was sort of afforded only to the larger players. And so, um, you know, what Flexible Pouches aims to do is sort of empower those entrepreneurs and small business owners so that they can compete at the retail shelves because at the end of the day, that's, you know, that's where consumers, uh, you know, kind of interact with their brand and that's their first interaction with your product, right? And so, um, you know, you can have the best product in the world, but if, uh, if a competitor packages it better, you know, that, you know, doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Right. And so that's, that's kind of where we come from. And so uh, flexible pouches uh, about us, we, you know, in order to kind of, you know, help out the smaller companies and entrepreneurs, we have the lowest minimums in the industry, the fastest turnarounds for custom printed flexible packaging. And so, you know, we work with uh, brands such as, um, uh, Trader Joe's, General Mills, all the way to mom and pops here. And so, you know, a couple of examples of some of the stuff that we've got here you know, is uh, some stuff you might find at your Trader Joe's or, you know, uh, basically you can go to any national major grocery sh store in the country and, uh, you know, find a product that uh, where the packaging has been designed and uh, produced by us. And so, um, you know, I, I started on this journey a, a few years ago here. I've got an engineering background. I worked, uh, a job in mechanical engineering in the in the oil and gas industry and so sort of did a transition 180 and uh, just sort of went cold into the entrepreneurial world here and so um, you know fell into flexible packaging and um, you know it's I learned a great deal and and going back just a few years I mean uh, you know uh, packaging is one of those things where um, I feel that entrepreneurs, when they start off, when they've got that brand new idea, they will, uh, you know, they're very enthusiastic about it and they're very, you know, you know, into it. And, and sometimes that, that enthusiasm can be, uh, unfortunately, you know, a, a blinded, you know, blind them in terms of, uh, you know, what they actually need to do from a business standpoint to ensure that, you know, they can reach the sales that they actually you know, need to get. Right. And so uh, I started on this. And then, uh, you know, we, we, we learned that uh, we, we reverse engineered the problem sort of, right? And so we said, all right, well, what, what makes a new product sort of, you know, you know, sell at the retail shelves, right? And we, we, we looked through all these studies that said um, consumers spend an average of seven seconds at the retail store shelf, right? And again, since we're, we're mostly doing flexible packaging, we're primarily in the food industry, but we're doing, you know, uh, everything from pharmaceuticals to farm uh, marijuana to cannabis, um, you know, you name it here. And so uh, customers go to the retail store shelves and they spend seven seconds before they make a decision. And there's so many competing products here. And so we realized that brand awareness is one of the single biggest keys in terms of, you know, actually um, establishing yourself as a product, establishing a new product, especially, and, um, you know, doing well on that. And so uh, a surprising number of companies, particularly small and growing businesses, struggle with the relationship between effective product packaging and long-term viability of that product and subsequently the brand. And most of the time we found that the relationship between this product packaging and how well it does, um, it, it affects businesses of all sizes, but um, it's because a disproportionate amount of resources are dedicated to new product perfection, right? And so under the false pretense that if my product is perfect, 
it will sell without any effort, right? Or it will sell, right? Maybe not any effort, but it will sell. And, you know, you look at historically across business that, you know, isn't always the case, obviously, right? And so it's, uh, it's a combination of, of, of various things. And so uh, not discounting the importance of effective, you know, having an effective or excellent product, but um, because, you know, because without the product, obviously, there's no value proposition. Uh, but the two sides uh, to the branding equation include the perfect product as well as being able to get the customer's attention. And so that's where product packaging uh, comes into play. Uh, and then the second reason I think uh, a lot of entrepreneurs fail to realize uh, or, you know, give enough importance to the product packaging is failure to recognize how stiff the competition is, right? Uh, this is particularly true in, in markets where quality rating is undeniably you know, more subjective, such as food. Um, and so, you know, when a consumer goes to the retail shelf and they've got dozens of options to choose from, uh, you've got to realize that a lot of the competitors out there, they may not be spending all the resources necessarily to perfect their product. Uh, they may be spending a disproportionate amount on alluring the, pro uh, the customer to their product so that you know their product wins a sale and so it's it's sort of a it's sort of a game there and so uh finally i think uh the the, the bigger picture in terms of packaging uh it, 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 you know there's it's an entire customer experience and so entrepreneurs need to realize when they are designing a a new product when they're launching a new brand especially uh there should be a focus on the entire consumer experience and that includes you know obviously the unboxing experience the opening experience but also uh throughout the life of the product right and so it doesn't matter what the product is if you're if your packaging breaks you know on your way home from the store or in transit from amazon to you uh you know, the consumers are significantly less likely to have a positive experience with that brand. And, you know, therefore it's a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a big, you know, red flag there. And so um, oftentimes the brands themselves haven't built an identity or a loyal customer base. And so because of that, I think that uh, for the small companies maintaining or maintaining a focus on that uh, customer experience becomes even more important. And so, uh, you know, again, we started this off and, uh, you know, we've been working uh, since 2014 uh, on flexible packaging here. And so, um, you, know, we, you know, we work with a number of companies out there. And so um, looking back on it, um, you know, I myself went through some of the same struggles that every entrepreneur sort of has. And so, um, you know, starting off, we were chasing some of these bigger customers, some of these um, more established brands that, uh, you know, may not be the general mills of, 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 of the, uh, you know, the landscape, but maybe the mid-sized brands. And so, um, you know, we, we, that's how we initially started getting our, our initial client base. And so uh, I realized one of the most important things to kind of focus on in, you know, when you're starting a new business is think long-term, right? Being able to get a sale here, being able to, um, you know, win a contract there uh, without regard for the longer-term viability of the business or how does that play into your longer-term business plan? How does that play into scalability, which is something I'll get to in a minute, um, is something that, you know, when you do start to grow, when you do start to do well, um, down the line, you'll realize that, Oh wow! Well, you know this this isn't really synced up, or you know there's 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 a lot of inconsistency. There's a lot of uh, 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 you know confusion, if you will, in terms of organization, right? And so um, once you get traction on a new business, once you've got your packaging design, once you've got everything kind of ready to go, uh, the growth phase of it. You know they say starting a business is one of the hardest things. True, but I've come to learn that you know even harder is the scaling part, the second step, right? And so scalability. So uh, you know, we started off in 2014 and, uh, you know, now here we are, we do, you know, three to 4 million units a month, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, flexible pouches, you know, stand up pouches, uh, three side seal bags, bottom gusseted bags, side, side gusseted bags. And so, you know, what actually got us there was sort of the ability to scale. Right. And so, um, how we did that was sort of a standardization of processes. Right. And so, um, there's nothing necessarily, uh, you know, unique about going out there and, you know, buying a flexible pouch, right? You know, there's, there's, you know, suppliers are a dime a dozen, but we kind of focus again from our standpoint on the customer experience there. And so uh, keeping those minimums to a low 
uh, ensuring some of the faster lead times, and then also making sure things are sort of standardized, right? So customers like standardized, uh, you know, things. They like things they can recognize. And so in order to kind of do that, you know, we, we had to sort of consolidate. We've got a standard size uh, table that we kind of use for a lot of our custom print jobs. But then at the end of the day, we also have the capability to run everything custom, right? So that allows, um, you know, a little bit of consistency within our business. Um, secondly, uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're in a growing phase now and we learned that, um, you know, customers want sort of an instant online experience as well. And so uh, one of the big pitfalls, especially in our industry, is there's a longer sales cycle in terms of, uh, you know, if you're out there trying to order some, some, some pouches, some packaging, um, and you have to email somebody and then you have to wait a few days for a quote and then you have to get back, back and forth. And so that ends up taking up a lot more time rather than being able to sort of go online, pick from something standard, um, select your options, go in and then, you know, buy the product, right? And so place your order. And so that's sort of an experience that we focused on. And so keeping in mind the customer experience will go a very long way in your business, regardless of what you're doing here. And so, you know, that's, that, you know, that, that's what gets us to being able to go from starting a business, getting those initial clients and then scaling to being a large company. Um, item number three, I guess uh, you realize is that, um, you know, at a certain point, you know, when you grow, there's actually a sweet spot in terms of growth as well. Uh, you, there is a thing as growing too fast, being able to actually handle a lot of that business, right? And so, um, you know, that if, you know, if you're playing your cards right, if things are working out right, that, when that happens, it sort of creeps up on you. It sort of happens faster than you think. And then you realize, oh, crap, I, you know, we're, 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 we're behind on, you know, tasks A, B, and C, or, you know, standardizing, um, you know, this procedure, or, you know, making sure that we have more of a robust process for, um, uh, you know, invoicing and, you know, making sure everything is sort of up to date. And so uh, getting started on those, um, you know, tasks up front in terms of standardizing your process, standardizing your procedures, and making sure the internals are in check, uh, also pretty important. And so, um, again, generally speaking, I think um, that uh, product packaging, uh, customer experience, and focus on uh, congruency, consistency, and organization are the key principles in order to kind of step up and, um, you know, grow a business from ground up and scale. And um, let's see, what else do we have? Yeah. So a little bit about us actually. So uh, like I said, we started off with some of those larger companies. Uh, we're based out of Houston, Texas. Uh, we have a distribution center in Houston. And one of the things that makes us sort of unique is that uh, a lot of companies that um, you know, want just in time uh, you know, packaging deliveries, uh, they, you know, custom producing packaging, uh, you know, that's whether it's flexible packaging, whether it's box packaging, whatever you're doing, custom producing anything really, there is a certain lead time associated with that. And so we have sort of a unique business model by which we will produce a certain batch, keep that in our inventory, and then allow customers to draw from it when it drops to a certain level, put another batch into production. And so again, all part of the customer experience. Um, let's see. Going back down, uh, next steps. So, um, flexible packaging. I guess uh, some of you guys out there may be pretty interested in, um, you know, sort of learning about the actual uh, technicals in terms of packaging, what's, you know, involved. And so there's a lot of uh, nomenclature out there. There's a lot of uh, terminology that can be pretty confusing. And so I'll start with some of the basics there. Um, there are two primary types of prints for, you know, custom printed bags such as this, right? These are flexible pouches, uh, stand-up pouches, three-side seal bags. Uh, the number one is the offset printing. So that is your rotogravure or your flexographic printing. These types of printings require printing plates or cylinders. And so that is, uh, you know, sort of historically the, you know, what the packaging industry has been. Um, and that's one of the one of the reasons why the minimums have been so high, um, just because these are you know, much larger presses, these are uh, uh, machines that require a certain web rewind. So you're talking minimums of 10,000 plus on you know, offset printing. Um, and uh, it is however cost effective, right? So if you are at the level where you're doing 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 
uh, you do want to go with an offset printing style just because that's what gets your cost down, your unit costs down. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of our, you know, medium to large size clients, that's, you know, that's the technology we use to print their, their stuff. Um, in the last two to three years, um, another technology called digital printing has come about and, uh, it's been around for, for, you know, several years, but only in the last three to four years has it really taken off. And so digital printing is for, uh, very small runs, uh, runs as small as a thousand units. And so that's where we kind of cater to those really small mom and pops entrepreneurs that are just starting off, just getting kind of a lay of the land. And so, um, Digital printing is a much faster turnaround. There's no printing plates, no printing cylinders. Um, it's basically imagine a uh, you know color laser printer for your computer, just industrial size, souped up for you know being able to print on flexible films. And so uh, we're noticing a significant traction in that. Um, yeah, you know, there was a statistic that uh, you know 2013, 99% of all the packaging in, in the world, flexible packaging in the world, was printed with offset. Only about one percent. Uh, that number has uh, fallen about 93 or 94%. So about six-fold increase in the last few years. And uh, we project that trend to only increase. Again, a lot of that will cater only to the smaller, uh, you know, run, smaller companies, mom and pops. When you get to a certain point, that will transition over to the offset, uh, flexographic or rotogravure printing. Um, other thing I wanted to talk about was in terms of the film usage here. And so a lot of companies, depending on what they're packaging, they will... Uh, come to us and say, can you give us a recommendation as far as what materials do we need? And so uh, materials that are used in flexible film-based bags, um, generally there are a couple standardized materials, but um, primarily there are uh, polyester, polyethylene, and uh, metallized films, right? And so these are your three primary film types to kind of play with, if you will. And so uh, a lot of people will confuse um, foil for metallized film. So there's, you know, there's metallized film, which is uh, literally, it's a sheet of plastic with a vacuum deposit of metal on it. And, uh, you know, to the undiscerning eye, it looks just like aluminum foil, uh, but it's really not. And so depending on what your shelf life requirements are, uh, you know, we can kind of guide you and, and help you out with that. But generally speaking, we will print your uh, artwork onto the outer layer. It's a reverse print, which means it's on the inside of the first layer. Uh, that's generally a polyester or a polypropylene film. Then that is laminated onto a metallized film, if that's what it calls for, metallized film or aluminum. Or, and then on the inside, there will always be a polyethylene layer. That's the heat seal layer. So when you, when you package a product and you fill it up, the top is heat sealable. You run it through a heat seal and the polyethylene on there will bond to the other side and it will be a perfect seal. And so these are really just the two or three primary standardized materials that are used uh, we do have the capability to custom run, basically, you know, if you need a certain thickness for your overall bag, if you have certain shelf life requirements that call for an aluminum foil, uh, maybe you don't need foil, maybe you have, uh, you know, slightly more stringent shelf life requirements, we put a metallized film in there. And so uh, based on that, that's uh, sort of the film uh, structure that we'll put into place. But everything is first printed, then laminated, and then um, formed into the palette that you see here. Um, finally, I guess, uh, if anybody's got any questions, um, you know, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, website is www.flexiblepouches.com. You can email me directly at, uh, Aperva, my first name, A-P-U-R-V-A at flexiblepouches.com. Uh, again, we're here to, uh, kind of help new brands out, even if, uh, you know, flexible packaging is not your, uh, you know, mode or, or, or style of packaging that you need. We can at least kind of guide you guys through, you know, some of the ins and outs of what goes into new product packaging design, um, and considerations for actually having a successful product at the end of the day. Wow. You know, I think that's fascinating, uh, packaging. And I, I guess I, I do have a, a, question I'd like to contribute sure. here, which is, you know, I, I think the service that you're offering, not only for food packaging, but even as you said at the end there, packaging in general for brands, I think this is really an underrated um, aspect of your brand representation to the world. I mean, especially right. as an Amazon seller or a private labeler of some kind, okay. you know, to the world, this packaging is going to appear like you manufacture the product that you're selling, right? That's right. And That's right. Brand is such a critical 
That's right. Component of this. Right. It's probably, I think one of the most important, um, you know, I guess, uh, important assets of right. a growing company. Would that's you right. agree? I think that's the, the number one most critical ingredient before even you talk about your packaging, before you talk about designing a product, even, um, you know, you want to make sure that the branding is there and that goes in line with what I was talking about in terms of consumer experience, right? When you, you know, you, you, know, you yourself can kind of, you know, recognize your favorite brands in any category, you know, it doesn't have to food, you know, anything you go to the store, you kind of resonate or, you know, and a lot of times, you know, when you look at it psychologically, you're, 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 you're really connecting with, um, uh, you know, the, the logos, the color, the, you know, sort of the brand that that company has established. Right. And so, um, that, you know, people really underestimate the value of that. Right. And people underestimate the value of once you have that, you know, you, you have the capability to, um, you know, really take your business to the next level. And so, um, you know, fully agree on that. Yeah. And I think, especially if your goal is to grow your brand to a point until, you can get it acquired by somebody mm -hmm. that brand value is going to be a multiplier Correct. of whatever the real value of your company might be. Correct. Yeah. I remember this is earlier in my career uh, being, I, I was in Michigan at the time and Gerber baby products was there and they were, I forget uh, you know, who, bought them or, or the company I was talking to sold it, I think, to a Swiss company. And I, I know this is an extreme example because it's a huge company, but they had estimated they got an extra $1 billion above the real value for the product lines they were selling because of the brand the value of that brand of the big value of the brand yes. basically right and that, that yeah, and that's that's what it is at the end of the day the last time i was on here talking with tracy i think she referenced an article she wrote which uh was about you know million dollar companies don't buy 9.99 dollar logos or something like that yeah. right and, yeah, yeah that, that really yeah there's really value in in that in that idea really right and so when you're starting off right um you know Cutting corners is, um, you, know, you, you don't want to cut corners when it comes to establishing your brand identity, when it comes to establishing yourself, because that people don't realize how, you know, what that will actually transform into if you actually, you know, do work on your business and, you know, grow to a certain level, because um, that's what customers will experience. And so that's um, uh, not something to be taken lightly. And, yeah. And so related to that, what, is there anything that you've seen a lot of companies make that you would call sort of a rookie error, a common early mistake with regard to their brand? Yeah. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, so we, we used to have one side of our, our business, which we're phasing out of now just because, you know, we, we don't think it's uh, in line with, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, which is, you know, we, do unprinted packaging as well. So we've got stock size bags of, um, you know, this is an example here um, for generic packaging, unprinted bags. Um, and, um, you know, we've got those at a warehouse. You can order them online. Uh, one of the things we, we, we saw a big pitfall uh, for customers was that, you know, a lot of times they would cut corners and say, oh, well, I don't have time to design an entire bag. I don't have time to get artwork. I don't have time to do all that. Or maybe, oh, you know, I don't want to spend the money up front for, you know, too many bags. We'll we'll get a case of five hundred. We'll tack on some labels and we'll go from there. And and I think that is really kind of shooting yourself in the foot to start with, right? I mean, maybe for samples at a trade show, that's primarily what we advocated for at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way to go. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you are looking to get into a major big box distributor retailer, um, you don't want off the shelf packaging. You don't want off the shelf stuff with you know just your your, your sticker on it, right? If, especially if that's going to be your image on the store shelf. And so um, we've had a lot of customers that come to us that are you know maybe a little bit on the smaller side that will say, oh, should we go with the digital print route? And you remember a few years ago that wasn't even really a thing, and you know now it's really blown up. And you know I would say that's you know about half our business now. And so you know that's it's really allowed customers to um, you know get up there and uh, really compete with you know the brands of the likes of Gerber at the end of the day. And so when we see customers approach us and say, ah, you know, well, we'll just get a case of 500. It'll, it'll ship out the same day and we'll have it next week. We'll print some labels and go on there. We find uh, not surprisingly that, you know, many times those are the brands that aren't coming back at the end of the day for larger, you know, you know, custom printer, because you know, that, that, that kind of kills your brand right there in, in our opinion. And so, um, no, I think that makes sense. I think those are words to the wise. You know, if, if you think you can't afford 
to uh, to create the right brand, mm-hmm. you may be right. You can't afford it because you're not going to be in business much longer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. What is it they say? If you you if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It's the mindset, right? Correct. Um, exactly. Right. Both. Both are right. Yeah. That's a yeah. <laughs> thing, right? The one who thinks he can and can't are both right. And so, uh, one more thing I did want to touch on real quick on the flexible packaging here um, is that you know, as an example, when you go out there, you know, I, I'm mentioning these these plastic films, poly films that are used in, in the construction here. Um, you know, polyethylene, right? It's a heat sealer. Like I said, I don't want people to go out there and think that this is the same kind of plastic that it's that's in your grocery store bag right you go to walmart or you go to you know a grocery store and you come back with a plastic bag that's also low density polyethylene technically the same polymer that's used on the heat seal layer uh the difference here with 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 flexible pouches and uh you know a lot of folks may know this but uh, they these are engineered barrier films so these are these are films uh necessarily that are something we call biaxially oriented so basically sheets of film that are oriented and uh, that are uh, stretched in both directions, the horizontal direction and transverse and the machine direction is what it's called. And what that does is uh, A, gives it very strong mechanical properties so that you don't have uh, issues such as you know, breakage or tearing uh, during, you know, your, your, you know, while your product is in there or while you're shipping it. Um, and then more importantly, it gives it the barrier properties. That is the single most governing thing, at least for food, but also other things as well, right? I mean, a lot of products out there, depending on what materials are used to construct the product, you know, as an example, you know, copper or steel, whatever, uh, plastic, uh, you know, if you have a certain oxygen transmission rate through your packaging over time, depending on how long it's sitting on the shelf, right, things can start to kind of go bad in there, right? Obviously, that's, you know, food is significantly more sensitive to that. And so it applies to that a little bit more. But, um, you know, these films are designed with very specific um, uh, barrier transmission characteristics in terms of limiting the amount of oxygen that can go in, limiting the amount of moisture. And, um, you know, these are technical values that we publish on our website and, uh, yeah, you can go and, and, and look those up and, um, you know, there's an entire science behind packaging, right? And so it, it gets yeah. into the deep. And so, uh, the point is it's not just, you know, typical, you know, plastic that you'll see in a, in a grocery store bag or anywhere else. These are, uh, barrier films that are, that are used to, to actually construct these bags. Um, well, and actually I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I was going to make sure to let our audience know is that, you know, it is a highly technical field packaging and all the food requirements and all of the different properties of different materials. But the good thing is if you're, you know, watching this and you, you have a product or a food item that you need to come up with packaging for, guess what? You do not need to become an expert in packaging because you have an expert here right. who knows all of that. His team, right. his company knows these things. And so you can seek the help of an expert and right. just to come to a Perva with here's the product that we want to sell. Exactly. And here's and, and that's what we have a lot of. Yeah, we have a lot of yeah. customers that say, you know, this is this is my startup idea. This is, you know, this is what we're packaging. We've we've got the product kind of perfected down. We've done our, you know, in, in the in the case of food. And I keep talking about food because that's that is a good chunk of our business, although we're we're doing stuff like hygiene products, pharmaceuticals, other consumer we we were working on a project with Oral B actually doing uh, some uh, mouth cards, right? And so the, mm. yeah scope is unlimited, but, um, you know, they come to us and say, this is our product. This is what we've got. We've got all the, you know, business side of the, uh, product development under, under the wraps, but how do I package it? You know, what, what do I need? Right. And so, you know, we'll give you guys some reading material if you, if you so choose, if you want to go through it, but you know, the goal is not for every, every brand owner to become an expert on, you know, the technical, the product packaging, you know, you guys have a business to run. And so the goal is to kind of let us help you guys out, you know, hold your hand and walk you through the process, advise you, answer any questions you may have in terms of why we're, you know, suggesting what we're suggesting, but then kind of, you know, taking charge from there. So that's kind of the idea. That makes perfect sense. So that's, that's what I would do. uh, Product launchers. I would, I don't have the time to become an expert (laughs) in packaging. If anything, I would just find in the market, certain qualities of packaging that I like maybe, or that, that speak to me in terms of, you know, you you know, like you said, user experience, right? Right. There's a feel to it. There's a certain quality there and a user experience, but ultimately the requirements for the product that you want to sell will dictate a lot of what the material should be. But 
above all else, the brand is critical. Can't emphasize right. that enough. Right. And that's, and if you, you know, haven't figured out your brand, that's, that's probably the number one thing. You know, when you were mentioning about the stock packaging that you're getting out of, uh, I actually respect that you're getting out of that, that, you know, you're probably, you know, losing a little yes. income there per year, but you know, I would, I think I've seen people doing things like that, mostly like the local farmer's market or yeah. something, right? I yeah. mean, if you're at that level, maybe that's what you there, need. Again, there is maybe a market for it at a trade show or a local farmer's market or, you know, packaging home goods, right? And so the goal is, you know, for our, you know, this is our brand identity because we're doing the same thing. We're also a small growing company. Uh, you know, we want to kind of make sure that, um, you know, since we're catering to some of the small businesses, we don't want to give the message off that, you know, this is what we're recommending, right? And, you know, maybe it was appropriate a few years ago when that was the, you know, better alternative but there are even better alternatives now to get your brand out there and so in part that's the reason and yeah that is you know a chunk of lost revenue we think we'll make it up and you know in other ways but at the end of the day the goal is to make sure you know, we're, we're out there helping brands realize their true potential through effective product packaging that's well that's fantastic right there and you know the other reality probably is you know how much time and energy do your employees have to spend dealing with those very small yeah. orders right from right. an overhead and a, a profitability and efficiency right. standpoint it probably right. is not the business right. you want to be in right right exactly right and you know we're, we're in the custom producing business the custom manufacturing business and we've kind of standardized that like i was talking about earlier and so that's kind of our, our, our route forward and how we plan to grow and uh yeah, another point to kind of bring up and, and this is important you know flexible packaging is is, is making wins right you, know, you go to the store you see soup these days packaged in flexible bags whereas it was all exclusively in cans before right uh that being said uh, you know, flexible packaging may not be the most appropriate uh, form for everybody, right? There's there's a, a, a huge class of products, and you know, I'm, you know, I'm of course outside of food, but uh, even in food, that you know, a can or a rigid or a glass, you know, certain you know, other type of packaging style is more appropriate, and that's sort of a consideration that you want to have as well when you're looking at it. However, the trends, if you look at the numbers, um, you know, there is a, you know, an undeniable trend in the rigid to flexible packaging transition yeah. and how brands are kind of going with that, right? And so um, there's reasons for it and there's, you know, pros and cons. And, you know, some of the pros, obviously, you know, we would list include the efficient volume and weight considerations, right? Uh, oh, yeah. There's a, you know, we've got a page on our website that kind of just has a just rough comparison. If you guys are, you know, if both will work and hey, which, which way do we go? It talks about um, how, you know, when you are, for example, buying empty packaging to transport to your co-packer or wherever you're, you know, filling your product, um, you know, an empty, an empty stand-up pouch flattened, you know, and, and you know, you know, when it's transported, um, you know, you will have 30 times significantly less volume utilization to transport that than you would glass jars, right? So, um, you know, just kind of stuff like that, right? That there are considerations, you know, saving costs, saving the environment and so forth. Um, you know, increased branding, you have, uh, you know, you know, more real estate for basically, you know, putting your brand on there. You typically find, you know, full bleed printed bags that have edge to edge print. And so, you know, sort of an opportunity. And so these are all things you want to keep into consideration not just, you know, if you're getting a flexible pouch or if you're doing, just in general, when you are going back to designing that, 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 that brand identity sort of to, you know, have a fantastic consumer experience, you want to be able to understand what are your limitations, basically, depending on what you go with. So. Wow, fantastic. Well, Aperva, I can't thank you enough for coming on again today and sharing your wisdom with our audience. Absolutely. And I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people, listening to or watching this episode will be reaching out as they should uh, right. for their, not only their packaging needs, but I think also for, you know, even uh, some of the other things that you you've offered as well. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and and so much I, I learned something today and, and that's great too. So, uh, Absolutely. all right. Well, what we'll look forward to having you again on a future session here, of product launch hazards for now. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll talk to you next time.